so today we are going to start the the course by looking at the about all the things that come together to put this science in a manner that we study it to today right so first of all microbiology is an umbrella science it it covers a lot of different disciplines there's a there's a lot of different foci of study underneath the 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 discipline of microbiology, right? And we're gonna be looking at that, but we're gonna look also, we're gonna talk about in general, because we'll get into the specifics later on, but we're gonna talk in general about how, um, or the, what, what, what the different microorganisms are that, we, that we're gonna study and how they interact, right? This particular course where, if we think about microbiology as being this huge discipline, right? We're gonna be looking at a fraction of that, right? Because we're only interested in the way these microorganisms interact with the human host, right? So just as a check, can I get can I get somebody to say I can hear you or put it in the chat? You sound okay. Um, I can hear just so you. That I, okay, perfect. I can hear you too. Excellent. Okay, let's go then. So, if we think about microbiology, right? We're going to be looking at all these organisms that a lot of people call germs, right? Now, germ, I don't like the word. Because germ simply means what? We don't know, right? Is it a bacteria? Is it a virus? Is it a fungus? Is it a protozoan? What is it, right? So I, I like to be more specific in the way that we talk about things. But we have to consider also that as scientists, and especially people who are going to go into healthcare, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be able to effectively communicate with um, the lay person, right? The, the people who your patients are. And so you have to be able to understand that, that they're not going to have the same background and knowledge that you do, right? And so you have to be able and willing to sit there and listen to them and then answer them in a way that, that they can understand you. Because if you think about how sometimes physicians might really talk to students and say them say something like, well, you have um, idiopathic uh, enteritis, and then like, oh, okay. Well, what the hell is idiopathic enteritis, right? Not many people are going to know that's that's an infection of the but we don't know how you got it. That's what the doctor said, but he should have said is, you know, you have an infection of um, of the small intestines. We're not sure how you got it, but we're going to try to help you get rid of it instead of saying you have idiopathic enteritis, right? So again, we're thinking about how we can make sense of all this stuff. And so we're going to be looking at those things today, okay? So the science started a long time ago when people didn't really have the tools to be able to appreciate the microbes um, as we can today, right? And the first individual that you need to know of importance is Carl Linnaeus, Carolus Linnaeus, right? And so if you think about him, he was the first individual to say, hey, I've made some observations because they didn't have microscopes back then. He's made some observation. He said, to me, there's some things that share common characteristics. So he said, everything's either a plant or an animal, right? And even today, a lot of our taxonomy, a lot of the way that we look at things in nature and the way that we study them are really based on that foundation that, that Linnaeus provided, right? He was also the guy who came up with the, with the binomial nomenclature system. So binomial means two names. We call it today the scientific name, or more specifically, we say that's a genus and a species, right? And so if we think about that for a minute, the genus of a human is Homo, and the species is Sapien. Right, so Linnaeus came up with these ideas about, you know, he started to put things into categories. He had plants or animals, and then he started to think about how you could name them. And so that gave rise to what we call the binomial nomenclature system, okay? Anton van Leeuwenhoek came after him, and he was a mathematician, but he was so smart. He was able to do all kinds of calculations, and he developed the first microscope. Now, this was 
kind of rudimentary, right? But he could see smaller things in a drop of water. And he started to observe this. And he, if you look at his observations, you know, he, he was putting things into other categories. So he came up with, you know, some things are fungi. We knew what fungi were, but we didn't know that they were smaller fungi, right? He's talking about protozoans and he talked about algae and bacteria and the archaea. Does anybody know what the archaea are? What are the archaea? What are the archaea? Anybody know? Do they have to do with spiders? No, no, that's that's an arachnid. Um, but archaea are bacteria also, but they are what we call ancient bacteria, right? Archaeology uh, is the study of ancient civilizations, right? They're prokaryotic, extreme thermal. There can be extreme thermophiles. They can be other things too. There are archaea in your backyard, right? But we don't really study them all that much <coughs> because they don't, in this course, because they don't have a lot of clinical relevance, right? They don't cause infection or intoxication, right? But they, but we knew that there were organisms in these different environments, right? And then small animals. So you can see how we started with putting organisms into different groups, right? Because of the work that was done by Linnaeus and also by Van Leeuwenhoek, right? So the types of organisms we're gonna look at and why they're important, right? We're gonna look at bacteria. These are all single-celled organisms. We're gonna look at bacteria. We'll mention the archaea. We're not gonna talk about them too much because mostly they don't have clinical relevance. We'll look at fungi, yeast, We'll look at protozoan parasites that are single-celled, and we're going to look at algae, right? And then multicellular, we're going to look at the multicellular parasites like hookworms and flukes and tapeworms and things like that, right? And then we're going to look at moles because they do have clinical relevance. They can cause infection. And we're also going to look at the macroscopic um, fungi like uh, the mushrooms or the toadstools and the puffballs because some of them can cause intoxications, but also um, they're important for all kinds of reasons, right? Because this, this course is interested in studying the organisms as they interact with the human host, right? And then non-cellular infectious agents that we're gonna look at are things like viruses and prions. When I say non-cellular, what do I mean? What do I mean when I say non-cellular? Almendera. What what does that mean? Not living outside. Oh, that that is true, Ava. That is true about these these infectious agents that are non-cellular. They have to live inside a host. But uh, but what does non-cellular mean? No cells. That's correct. So in the case of a virus, it's a protein covering and a nucleic acid. And that nucleic acid is either DNA and R or RNA, but not both, right? And with prions, anybody ever heard of a prion? Anybody ever heard of a prion? What is a prion? A prion, a prion, or infectious proteins. So you've already learned something new today, right? That's my goal. Every day you should learn something new. Now you might not know what a prion is, but you've heard of prionic diseases. I know you have. How many people have ever heard of mad cow disease? Yeah. So if you've heard of mad cow disease, that's a prionic disease, right? Infectious protein. And uh, man, we not only have to worry about the, the organisms that are cellular, but now we have to worry about acellular things too that can cause problems, right? It's an amazing thing that we're gonna, that we're going, this adventure we're about to go on this semester is gonna be amazing because you're gonna get to see all kinds of different perspectives and you're gonna get to see um, how these organisms interact with us. Right. So, Michaela, I want to follow up on something uh, you said uh, just a little bit ago when we were talking about um, we were talking about cells and things like that. Um, or, or, so we have to be careful that we don't confuse because a lot of people will do this. Right. 
they'll, they'll confuse acellular with a nuclear or without a nucleus, right? So there's a difference there, right? You can have a cell that has no nucleus. That would be the bacteria, right? Um, but something that is non-cellular, acellular is not going to even have a cell. Okay, so I want to be sure that we understand the difference. Okay, so I'm going to present a little bit about each of the group of organisms, and then I'm going to tell you how we classify them. So let's look at the bacteria first. So the bacteria, you, can you everybody see that there are purple bacteria and there are red bacteria? Can you see that? Yeah, these are when they when they get stained, right? So we we put these into two different categories, and those two different categories are either gram positive or gram negative, right? So gram positive or gram negative, right? And so we just simply a lot of times just say a GP or a GN. Now that's the tool. The tool is staining, the tool stains the cell, but what is used to classify them is the differences in their cell wall, right? Their cell walls are different, and so we can use the staining tool to figure out if they're gram positive or gram negative, okay? So if I ask you on, on, on our exam, how are bacteria that are medically or clinically relevant, how are they classified? You're going to say what? Gram positive and gram negative. That's the tool, but what are what is used to classify them? What do we look at? What characteristic do we look at? The differences in cell wall, Ava. That is correct. That's exactly correct, Jenna. Right? It's the cell wall, the difference in the cell wall. So I make I make reference to the bottom here, right? And so you can see there are three morphologies. Ooh, that's a pretty cool word, morphology. How many people have heard of that word before? How many people have heard of the word morphology? Amy. So when you say by the cell wall, are you talking about the shape? Not the shape the construction of the cell wall. So let me make, let me make an analogy. Um, so think about the way your skin is designed, right? You have an epidermis, you have a dermal layer, and you have a subcutaneous layer, right? Making a reference to your AMP background. So now cell walls of bacteria are different because they have different things that make up the cell wall. Okay? Amy, is that, does that clarify that for you? Yeah, like the layers and such. Okay. The layers, exactly, the layers, okay. So we were talking about morphology. Anybody, can you tell me, have you heard of that term morphology? What does it mean? What is morphology? So that's the shape and the structure of the cell. So you can see here that bacteria have three different morphological distinctions. They're either a coccus, they're a bacillus or they're a spirilli. Those are the three morphological characteristics. Okay? Good. So now let me let me continue on with, with your knowledge of anatomy and physiology. Excuse me one second. I'm nasally today. I don't know. Cedar must be crazy. But um, let me make let me make uh, let me build on your knowledge of anatomy and physiology. In this slide right here, that one. What am I looking at, or what are we looking at? What are we looking at? Anybody? Can anybody tell me? Not spirilli. Oh, oh, oh. So, okay. Um, I think you guys are getting ahead of me. So, can everybody see that right here are the cocci? I agree. Those are cocci. But I'm looking at these other structures right here. These big old structures right here. There's a bunch of them right here. Right. This is a bunch of them. What are those things? 
I agree with you guys. They look like cells. What kind of cells, Jenna? Oh, not RBCs. They don't have the shape of the RBC. But if they're not an RBC, they are what? A white blood cell. That's correct. Do you know which one? Okay. How about specifically? When you guys talked about uh, anatomy and physiology, did uh, your anatomy and physiology instructor tell you which of the white blood cells, that's correct, Ava, which of the white blood cells show up when you have an infection of bacteria, they're neutrophils, right? So here you can see neutrophils and you can see the gram negative because they're red, gram negative coxy, right? So here is how you apply the science you know. So if you say that's a gram negative coxy and you see all these white blood cells, somebody is having a raging infection. And depending on where in the body you're having that, it can be lots of different things, right? So if it's coming from the cerebral spinal fluid, somebody's got encephalitis or meningitis, right? If it's coming from the blood that you took out of somebody's arm, um, it's septicemia, it's, it's, it's bacteremia, it's an infection of the blood. And if it's coming from the, from the genitalia, this is gonorrhea, right? So that's how we can use our knowledge of these organisms and where we recover them from the human body to figure out what they are, okay? And that's what we're trying to get you guys to be able to do. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to diagnose every single thing, but at least you'll have an understanding of what the, what the organism might be. When I was in clinical practice, anytime I had any kind of specimen that I was going to try to figure out what the infectious agent was, if I knew where it came from, I had an idea of what the pathogen might be, right? Or what the organism that's causing the infection might be. And so those are the things I would look for because there's some very common ones, okay? So again, if I ask you on an exam, how are bacteria classified? What are you gonna tell me? What are you By gonna the tell me? differences in the cell wall? by the differences in the cell wall. Very good. So okay. does that mean just like their shapes, the ones that you nope, want? Nope. To? So the shape is important as a secondary characteristic. Mm -hmm. So so um, what we do is we always say gram positive or gram negative first, right? All right. That's mm -hmm. right, Sarah. Oh, so okay. the positive is purple and red is negative. But that's the tool. The differences really lies in the cell wall. And we're going to be talking about cell walls next week on Monday, right, for bacteria. But today we're laying the foundation. And then after that, Amineta, we say gram positive, gram negative, and then we give the morphology. So it can be a gram positive coccus. It can be a gram positive bacillus or a gram positive rod. It can be a gram negative coccus. It can be a gram negative bacilli and it can be a gram negative spirilli. Okay? Everybody with me so far? You can never have a gram positive spirilli. Write that down. You can never ever have a gram positive spirilli. They don't exist. And there's a reason for that. But we're not going to get in that today. I will ask you that question on Monday, and I'll come back to this question. Do you remember I said there could never be a gram positive spirilli, and I'm going to want you to tell me why that's true. Okay? The archaea. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the archaea, but, you know, I don't want you to go through a microbiology course and never having heard about the archaea, because a lot of people don't know that they're out there. But they're everywhere. They're in your backyard. They're also in extreme areas, right, where you think they can't live, right? The geothermal vents of the ocean, right? The ashy boundaries of a, vo of a volcano, of a volcano, uh, 
in the salt marshes and salt mines and everywhere you think there can be nothing growing here, they are growing. As a matter of fact, one of the most famous archaea was isolated from a geyser, right, in Yellowstone. And that particular organism has become famous, Thermus aquaticus, because that's what we use. We use the enzymes from that particular organism to do PCR, polymerase chain reaction, right? Uh, and so it's pretty interesting to think about how even if it's this archaea, it does have a lot of relevance to what we do. It's just outside the scope of this particular course, okay? So a question I might ask you on the exam is, which of the organisms would most likely be found in an extreme environment, right? And your answer would be the archaea, okay? They are bacteria, right? So you have bacteria that we just talked about, and that'd be the bacteria that we come in contact all the time with, right? That are classified gram positive or gram negative. And that'd be things like tuberculosis, it'd be E. coli, Staph aureus, all those things, strep throat, all those things are the bacteria. But the archaea are also bacteria, but a lot of times they don't have any clinical relevance. Okay? Questions? Fungi. We're going to talk about the fungi in the lab, right? So the fungi are important, right? And there are three different, there are three different groups of fungi, right? We have the yeast, and a lot of people do not, do not know that the yeast are fungi, but they are. We have the moles, right? And so, uh, oops, moles. And then we have the macroscopic organisms. And the macroscopic organisms are things like the mushrooms, the puffballs, the bracket fungi, all those things you see growing in, on trees or, or in, in the ground, right? And they all have some clinical relevance, right? And so we're gonna be talking about them. But the yeast are classified by um, their morphology, but also their physiology, right? You can tell them very easily because they produce this structure, they, they produce this type of structure right here. Can anybody tell me what that, what that particular structure is at my arrow? Anybody tell me what that is? Budding cells, that's correct. Uh -huh. And that is that is a classic characteristic of the yeast. The moles, they have mycelia, right? Mycelia are these elongated vegetative structures and one cell in that is called a hypha. And then they have a bunch of spores. And the spores are like fingerprints. So all of the moles produce different types of spores and their fingerprints. Therefore, we can identify these organisms, these moles, by their spores. The mycelia, the vegetative structures, are important also. And we're going to talk about that in lab today. Okay? I had a surprise this morning. I woke up about 5.30 and I went to have breakfast. And I decided I'm going to have oatmeal and I'm going to put blueberries in them. So when I went to get my blueberries, uh, this is what I saw, right? So can you see these white things growing on my blueberries? My blueberries were mushy, right? So that's mold, right? So I'm like, oh, heck. So I took out the blueberries that had uh, mold and I sequestered them, took a picture of them because I could add them to this particular presentation really quickly. And then I put the rest of the blueberries in my oatmeal. Uh, it was good, right? But really, these particular blueberries that have the mold on them could be eaten if you wanted to. They're going to be a little fermented. They might taste a little bit like alcohol, <coughs> but you could eat them. If I was hungry enough, I would eat them. I, I just didn't feel like eating them today. Okay. How many people would eat? How many people would eat uh, blueberries that had a little bit of fungus on them, a little bit of mold on them? Nope. <laughs> How
How many people like cheese? Okay, if you like cheese, then you know what you know how the cheese is made? Especially the more expensive cheeses. That's are you about made to ruin by... cheese for us? <laughs> huh? What's that? But are you about to ruin cheese for us? No, no, no. I'm not going to ruin cheese for you all. But, uh, hey, you know, cheese, a lot of times cheese is made because the mold that's growing on it gives it its flavor. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Blue cheese has got penicillium in it. Uh-huh. Oh, it's not gross. It's delicious. I love blue right? cheese. Oh, well, I'm not crazy about blue cheese, but I like a lot of other cheeses, right? And so, you know, if you go to HEB, especially if you go to one of the hoity toity or HEBs, right? You, there's a whole section of cheese in there, and you can go in there, and they will sell you cheese with the fungus still on it. Are you with me? I will, yeah, Central Market also sees it. You're right. But it's interesting to think on the fact that people think like if if there's a if if you have a nice block of cheddar cheese in your refrigerator and you go to eat it and it's got a it's got a green mold growing on it people think that they can just cut off the green part of the cheese and then eat it well that's perfectly fine but why do you spend all that time cutting off the green or the the green stuff off of it because that's just the spores of the of the mold the mycelia, the vegetative structures, the part of the body is in the cheese. Are you with me? Yeah. And people are funny about it all the time. You know, they just they just think, well, I'm going to get rid of the mold. No, you're getting rid of the spores. The vegetative structure is in the cheese already. And so if you go to Antonelli's or go to HEB and buy cheese there, and it's got mold on the outside. People cut it off. Eat the mold. It's good. It's not going to hurt you. Are you with me? Good? Yeah. Why not, Rosa? Now, Rosa, I think you know me well enough that, that you know, I eat crazy things. And so when we get back, when we get back in person, I have... In my refrigerator here, because I do this sometimes, I have yogurt that is over a year old. Uh huh. So I am going to eat that yogurt for you when we go back to in person, right? Because if I do it here online, you're probably just going to say, Provi, uh, you probably just ate the, you probably just ate it, and you didn't let us see the expiration date. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Rosa. When we're back in class, I'm going to let her examine the yogurt and see that it's expired over a year. And then I'm going to open that yogurt up and I'm going to eat it right in front of everybody. Okay? Because there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? <laughs> Some people get grossed out. Uh, not me. Okay? All right. Let's look at protozoans. So protozoans are single-celled organisms. Some of them have a lot of clinical relevance because they can cause a lot of problems on us. So protozoans, write this down, are characterized by how they move, right? So you can see the top, the top um, slide right here. It, these are pseudopoda, and this is an amoeba. So the amoeba move by an extension of part of their of their structure and then the rest of the cell follows it, right? So it's pretty interesting to watch. I could, uh, Amandera was um, with me in 1406 and we, we got to see some amoeba and I could just watch amoeba all day. They're just fascinating to me, right? Here are ciliated cells uh, or a ciliated cell. You can see the cilia and they move by cilia. And here is a pathogen that's in blood. You can see there's a, the red blood cells here, but then here you see the organism itself, and here's the flagella, right, or flagellum singular. And so it's pretty interesting to see that these organisms are classified by how they move, and we'll be talking about these organisms 
in lab, but also we'll be talking about them and about midterm, we'll bring back the, the, the protozoa and the parasites so that we can talk about them in some detail, right? Because they're fascinating. And the way that they can affect us as humans is just uh, unbelievable, right? As a matter of fact, the organism on the bottom of this particular slide, these are called a trypanosome. Trypanosome, right? And they can cause African sleeping sickness, which we're not gonna see very much in the United States. But what we will see is Chagas disease. How many people have heard of Chagas disease? Nope. Says out here learning all kinds of stuff today, right? But Chagas disease is from this protozoan and it gets into the body and it can cause uh, cardiomyopathy. It can cause the infection of the surrounding of the heart or the heart tissue, or it can cause intestinal distress. And this is here in Texas, right? This is gonna be one of those things we're gonna have to deal with because we're gonna start to see patients have infections of the stuff. We don't see very many. There's a couple here and there nowadays, but but mostly we're seeing it in dogs. But we're gonna start to see this infectious agent uh, in humans, right? Chagas disease, Trypanosoma cruzi is the, is the scientific name. Um, it's, it's an amazing infectious agent, right? And the way it gets into the body is even more amazing. You get a rejuviate bug, right? Now, oh, well, here's another term that that Cessa's gonna love. Rejuviate bug. So not many people know what the rejuviate bug is. Does anybody know what that is? So, but what if I said kissing bug? What if I said kissing bug? Would you know what that is? Uh-huh. Yeah, they're pretty prevalent. And they're in my backyard. The kissing bugs are in my backyard. <laughs> Chagas disease can kill you, um, but... Um, but probably you're gonna get treatment and we're gonna figure out what's going on. We're gonna be able to treat you with an, with an anti-protozoal drug, right? My favorite one is metronidazole. And it'll take care of business for you, right? But it might be that your heart is so damaged or maybe your intestinal tract is so damaged because you have an infection of this that maybe you have to, you have to live with that particular um, constraint for the rest of your life. So these are serious things that most people never think about, but they're out there, right? And that's why you take a course like this to understand how these things can interact with you, right? Algae, algae are, are important. Now, most of them are just beautiful. Look at, look at these beautiful little creatures, right? And so, you know, algae are important to humans, why? Can somebody tell me why algae are important to humans? Why are algae important to humans? Because we can eat them, right? We can eat seaweed, which is algae, right? They have a lot of nutrients in them. They taste a little salty, but they're okay. We classify them by the pigments that they store, right? And so they're the blue-green algae, the green algae, the yellow algae, the brown algae, the purple algae, and the red algae, right? And each of them have different places where they live in the ocean, right? Now, have you all heard of any of these algae, right? And anybody heard any anything about algae? How about the blue-green algae? Have you heard of the blue-green algae? What have you heard, Miss Amy? Oh, not can, specifically about it, just the the name of okay. it. So in the last two summers, 
the blue green algae have been causing problems in town lake and so because people's dogs died from coming in contact with the toxins that are produced by the blue green algae uh-huh there you go so they can produce toxins that can really affect the dog right now there was a case out in california where there were people there were people who were on a back there was a family of a, a, a mother and a father and a little kid and the dog right and they found them all dead by this pond they were swimming in right so they they thought that maybe they got into this pond and there was so much toxin in that pond that the toxins from the blue, blue green algae died killed them right they died because they came in contact with that with that toxin so the algae are important right yeah they're beautiful but given the right conditions they can cause problems how many people have ever heard of a red tide how many people have ever heard of a red tide or a brown tide two years ago Two years ago, in the southern part of Florida, there was a red tide, and people were trying their best because when red tides happen, they kill all sea life. With the red tides, when that happened, the a lot of people in Florida were pulling the manatees out of the water because the manatees were dying, and they were putting the manatees in in pins where the water had been filtered so that they, that they could recover. And then when the red tide was over, they let the manatees, um, they released the manatees. Those are really good people because the manatees are a beautiful creature, right? And we don't want them to die. But red tides happen because of pollution, right? Too much pollution in the water, and that's usually fertilizer, uh, but it can be other things, cause the algae to go crazy, to bloom, and then you have a red tide, right? So there are problems out there that probably before this class, you never even thought about. Some of you didn't make the connection of the organisms that were killing dogs in Town Lake to the fact that they were the blue-green algae, which really are not eukaryotic at all. They are prokaryotic. So really the proper word for them would be blue-green bacteria because they are bacteria. Yeah. Any questions so far? Viruses. So most people don't think of viruses. I think about them all the time. And really, <laughs> you know, yeah, COVID-19 is a virus. But, uh, you know, COVID-19, we've known about for a long time. But it wasn't until it mutated that it became problematic, right? So SARS-CoV-2 is its real name. We call it COVID-19. And so if you think about that COVID-19, right? If you think about COVID-19, let's look at that word for a minute. Does anybody know what COVID-19 stands for? Does anybody know what COVID-19 stands for? COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Infectious Disease 2019. That's what it means, right? But we use that acronym for SARS-CoV-2 because nobody wants to say SARS-CoV-2 or what it really stands for, right? So we use COVID-19, right? COVID-19, you might have heard that there are are three mutations that affect humans, right? There's the first one, then there was a Delta variant, and now there's the Omicron variant, right? But really that virus, COVID-19, has mutated thousands of times, over 20,000 times it has mutated. The only ones we hear about are the ones that make us really sick. The others, the other mutations that occur, uh, we don't hear about, right? But these are really dangerous, infectious agents. And the thing that really surprises me is that people are afraid of Ebola. How many people have heard of Ebola? 
How many people have heard of hemorrhagic fever by Ebola? Okay, good. Good. Are you afraid of Ebola? Like if we're in a house and you and I are brother and sister or brother and brother or whatever, and one of our friends has Ebola and they're on the other side of the house, but we're on this other side of the house, should we worry about it? Now, our, our friend on the other side of the house has caregivers. They've got people coming in and taking care of them. But we're not going over there. Should we worry about Ebola? My brother would leave. He's afraid of every little infectious agent there is, right? I'm not afraid because Ebola is an infectious agent of caregivers. The only people that are going to acquire Ebola are those individuals that are coming in direct contact with the patient that has Ebola. If I'm on the other side of the house, I'm not going to be exposed to Ebola, right? Now, to take, to make, I mean, I'm being a little bit, I'm, I'm being a little bit dramatic. Because if there was Ebola, they would probably take everybody out of the house and move us into another house and sequester us for about 21 days to make sure we didn't get Ebola, right? But as long as we didn't come in contact with that individual, we're not going to get Ebola. Do you remember, uh, what, about five years ago now, there was a, an Ebola case in Dallas? Do you remember? Some of you might be too young to remember that. Yeah. I was getting calls from people. Should we be worried about Ebola? I'm like, you live in Austin. It's in Dallas. Why are you worried about it? It might come down here. Like, How is it going to come down here? <laughs> so people get excited for things that they don't need to get excited about. Yet, does anybody know which virus kills more people annually than any other virus? If you take away the years of COVID, right? But which virus kills more people on an annual basis than any other infectious. That's, that's right, Amy, flu. But people aren't afraid of the flu. Why aren't, no, not rhinoviruses, rhinoviruses are common cold, but, but the people aren't afraid of the flu. I don't get it. I don't get it. People won't get a flu vaccine because they're not afraid of the flu. But if Ebola was in Austin, Texas, and there was a And I've been vaccinated for more things than the average person because I'm a microbiologist, right? And so I've been vaccinated for all kinds of different crazy things. Right. It's, it's amazing to me that people have their kind of their priorities in different places. And mostly that's because we get educated by the television, right? Or by people who are, who we, who we, trust on the television, right? And the education process is different depending on what news station you watch. Uh, but people are afraid of Ebola, but they're not afraid of influenza, right? Yeah. Viruses are a thing to be reckoned with, uh, but we cannot be afraid of them all the time. Right. That doesn't mean that we don't mitigate risk. Right. So am I afraid of COVID-19? Hmm, not really. I'm a microbiologist. I'm a virologist. I'm a parasitologist. I'm a mycologist. I'm a bacteriologist. But the fact that I'm not afraid of COVID-19 doesn't mean that when I go to HEB, I don't wear a mask. It, it surprises me how many people are in HEB without a mask. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but people don't understand, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's just amazing to me, right? To me, when you wear a mask, it's a sign of respect. If you're wearing a mask, you're telling me, I care enough about you that I'm gonna wear a mask so that I protect you from me. Masks are not effective at stopping the transmission Otherwise, because viruses are nanometers in size. And those masks, even if you're using like my mask, right? Uh, I don't have it with me here, it's in my car. But my mask was designed by my beautiful wife and it has a place where I can remove and put in a new HEPA filter all the time. So I've got, I've got 
one of the better masks that are around, right? I don't, I don't, it's not going to be exactly like a K95 or N95, but it's close, right? And I'm going to send you later on, I'm going to send you the, the science behind the mask, right? Because if you're not wearing a mask now, you should be wearing a mask. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to change your mind. I'm just here to tell you what science says, right? And what I say here, you can decide whether or not you want to believe it or not. You can always do your own research, uh, but for God's sake, don't use Fox News as your research element, right? So um, I'll send you that. I'll send you that video about the science behind N95 mask, so you can see why we as scientists want people to wear masks. Okay. Quest Jones. Here's here. I'm going to blow your mind today. How many people think hand sanitizers are effective? Okay, Ava. No, why not? Can you tell me? I just remember doing this like experiment a long time ago and these people had like a like a blue light or something and they had a uh, yeah yeah you did yeah yeah beautiful right yeah so um let me address this right sarah says yes but you're gonna tell me that they aren't kind of right so oh for sure washing your hands yeah maybe a trick question no i don't do trick questions hannah there's no reason for me to trick you right but let me tell you the science behind hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers were designed by my company that I used to work for, uh, Abbott. And we designed them because when we would go talk to nurses, they would always tell us, we wash our hands so much that our hands get cracked. Can you help us have something that will allow us to keep our hands so that they don't get cracked all the time? So we developed my company did a lot of other companies did also there's a moylent and these moylents are hand sanitizers hand sanitizers if you read the directions you wash your hands and then you put the hand sanitizer on afterwards okay on the hand sanitizer has alcohol usually around 56 to 70 percent and what that does is the alcohol pulls the water away from your hands and therefore you have this grease this moylent that keeps your hands moist and looking good. Are you with me? Hand sanitizers were never supposed to be used as an equivalent to hand washing. Hand washing is effective, but hand sanitizers are not for all microorganisms except for viruses. Viruses are so small that the alcohol content will actually break them down, especially the ones like COVID-19 and influenza and things like that, right? So prior to the pandemic, I never used hand sanitizers. I am now using them because I understand the science behind them. So hand sanitizers, Miss Sarah, are effective against viruses because they're so tiny, but they're not effective against bacteria. And I'm going to show you that later in the course. I'm going to show you the scientific evidence, right, that shows that, that hand sanitizers are not effective against bacteria. So think about this. For gram-positive organisms, you would need to leave the alcohol so that it makes contact with the gram-positive cell for 10 minutes. For gram-negative, because it has a lot of lipids in its cell wall, you would have to leave the alcohol, the, the hand sanitizer on your hands for two minutes, right? For a virus that has a lot of lipids in its envelope, in its outer layer, like COVID-19, uh, less than a minute, okay? So I have been to HEB prior to the pandemic and I walk into HEB and as I'm walking in, I see these people wiping on their little buggies. See those people? And I'm down, right? Uh, now, HEB never did that, right? But these people would wipe down their buggies and I'm like, why are they doing that? Right? 
during a pandemic, when the pandemic first started, right, and we didn't know, we didn't know if fomites were important as a as a dispersion mechanism, right? So, ooh, that's a nice word. Uh, Mr. Cesar's gonna like it. Fomite. What's a fomite? Miss Ava, what's a fomite? What's a fomite, David? Anybody? What's a fomite? A fomite. That's okay. A fomite is any an inanimate object that can be used to transmit an infectious agent. That's right. So your phone is a fomite. Your pen is a fomite. My cup of tea that I'm drinking. Thank my wife for making me some respiratory tea because cedars really got me down today. But you might hear it in my voice, right? But so we used to think that maybe fomites played a huge role in the transmission of um, COVID. And so when that happened, HEB is pretty good, pretty responsible. You could watch HEB and they had a whole crew of people doing nothing but sanitizing the buggies, right? You would go out there, they would collect the buggies, they would spray them down, they would, they were using the proper contact time because I was watching them. They let it sit for a minute and then they wiped it off. Perfect, right? Yeah, no, so Michaela, I don't go to Target all that much, right? But I, I, if you say that, I appreciate that also, right? So I'm like, good, these are people, pretty responsible people, right? But they don't do that anymore because science changed, right? Science says, well, fomites aren't really involved. That doesn't mean that if somebody sits down at the table and sneezes on the table and you touch the, and you touch the sneeze and then touch your eyes, you're not going to get COVID because you will, right? But it's not the major root of transmission. The major root of transmission is the droplet nuclei from talking, sneezing, or coughing, right? But that's why you wear a mask. Because if you're wearing a mask and you cough, sneeze, or talk, that's going to stop most of the droplet nuclei from leaving your mouth and going into the airways where then it can be picked up by other people. People think they wear a mask so that they protect themselves. Maybe that's true a little bit. But mostly you wear a mask to protect everybody else around you. And that's why I say, when you wear a mask, it's a sign of respect. Okay? I care enough about you that if I have COVID, I want to protect you from me. Okay? Questions? Let's go on. So let's talk about how this science started, right? So a long time ago, the the entity of the world that had most influence was the church. And that's still true for a lot of people, right? The church says this is the way it should be. A lot of people will follow that, right? My, my mother was like that, right? Anything the church said, that's what we should do, right? So I'm not like that. I tend to make my own... I'm Episcopalian, but I tend to make my own my own determinations about what the church is saying because sometimes I just flat out disagree with them, right? But the church said that a whole time ago, the church said life spontaneously generates, and that's how we got all these folk these folk tales about the baby being brought by a stork and all these different things, right? Because the church really didn't want kids to understand that, that people had sex, right? And so they came up with these, all these things, right? So these are all influences by the church. There were people back then, scientists, who were challenging the ideas that were being laid out. And one of those individuals was Francisco Red Eye because the doctrine of the church basically said that life just spontaneously started, right? And they made the analogies that if you put rice on, on pieces of meat, it turned into maggots. And if you put horse hair and puddle water that became warm. So all these different things, right? Not true. But Francisco Reddy decided to try to explore where life came from. And so what he did is he developed this real simple experiment, right, about spontaneous generation or the disproving of spontaneous generation. He took three flasks and he put a piece of rotting meat in each of those flasks. And to one of the flasks, right, 
to the first flask, what he did was he let the flask open completely so that it could come in contact with the environment and there could be gas exchange, right? To the second flask, he covered it with cheesecloth. Now there could be gas exchange, but there could be no interaction with the environment, right? Under the third flask, he hermetically sealed it completely. And that means that whatever was inside of that flask was not gonna come in contact with the environment. And there was gonna be no way that gases could leave or could come into that particular container where that piece of meat was in, okay? And then he watched these flasks for about a week. And what he noticed was the first flask, that the flies were attracted to the smell, the odor of the decaying meat, and they came in, they landed on the meat, they ate a little bit of the meat, but they laid their eggs, their eggs hatched, became maggots. The maggots ate the meat, then they crawled away and they became adult flies uh, within that 1.2 week period, okay? The second flask, he noticed that the flies were really attracted to the meat because this was decaying, but, it, but the flies couldn't get to the meat, so they laid their eggs on the cheesecloth. The eggs hatched, they became maggots, but the maggots died because they had no nutrient source, right? And to the third flask, he noticed that the flies were not attracted to it at all because it was hermetically sealed, that there's no interaction between the environment and that meat, and there's no gas exchange, right? And so from this real simple experiment, Francisco Red Eye hypothesized that life did not spontaneously generate it. Life came from other life, right? And so he was reporting this to his colleagues, his scientists, and there was maybe some people who were like, well, okay, maybe, but of course, a lot of them were influenced by the the church, and so not many people bought into his to his to his ideas, right? He didn't have enough name recognition. What he needed was a superstar to come in and say he was right. And later, later, years later, he got help from a superstar. The superstar's name was Louis Pasteur. How many people ever heard of Louis Pasteur? Yeah, Louis Pasteur did a lot of work with vaccines, a lot of work with infectious disease, did a lot of work with food spoilage and fermentation, but he's most famous for his work with pasteurization, so much so that we call the process pasteurization. Pasteurization is a sanitizing method, right? Your milk and your juices when you buy them are pasteurized. And what that means is that most of the microbes have been removed. It's not a sterilization process, it's a sanitation process. If you buy a gallon of milk, Ava, at the grocery store and never open that milk, will that milk spoil? Eventually it will, that's right. Do you know why? Amy, do you know why? Cesar, wanna provide an idea of why that my, Michaela, bacteria. That's correct. It's a sanitizing process. It removes most of the bacteria, but there's still some bacteria in that milk. And so eventually, even at very cool temperatures like a refrigerator, that milk is gonna spoil, right? But most of the time, milk doesn't last long enough so that it spoils, right? And really, if it does spoil, what can you do with it? Don't throw it out. What do you do with it? You make buttermilk pancakes or buttermilk cookies, right? It's all good. Yep. Anyway, Louis Pasteur came in and he developed this little interesting little flask. Can everybody see that little flask right here? This little flask had this kind of gooseneck uh, ending to it. And what he did was he heated it up and he really sterilized the chicken broth that was in it, right? And then he just let that chicken broth sit there for months. And he noticed that that 
liquid was clear months later. What he did notice at the crux, at that bend of the neck for that flash, there was some dust, right? What is dust? Miss Michaela, what is dust? Can anybody tell me what dust is? What is dust? What do you think, David? It can be bacteria, but what dust is mostly us, right? Our our body, dead skin cells, that's right. So dust is mostly us, it's our dead skin cells. And sometimes there can be bacteria on there because there's bacteria on your skin. And so that dust right there contained microorganisms, right? And so what Pasteur did was he took that flask and he leaned it over so that the broth that chicken broth came in contact with the dust and then he stood it back up. And within hours, he noticed that the, that the clear liquid became cloudy. And that's a sign of growth of microorganisms, which you're gonna find out when we go back to the lab in person, is that anytime you have a cloudy liquid, there's bacteria in it, there's something in it, okay? So this allowed Pasteur to think about what he was doing. He said, you know, that red eye guy, that ready guy, he was onto something. Life does come from other life, but life also comes from the interaction with the environment, right? So bacterial cells got into the nutrient source and they had a nutrient source. So bacteria cells, one became two, two became four, four became eight, a thousand became 2000, a million became two million. And so you have this explosion of growth, it's exponential, right? And that happens everywhere. So let's take, <coughs> let's take your mouth. Is your mouth clean or is it dirty? It's dirty. It's pretty filthy, right? People spend a lot of time um, flossing and brushing. I do too, right? Uh, but let's say that you're going, getting ready for bed and you floss and brush your teeth and then you go to bed and you're sleeping for eight hours. What happens the next morning when you wake up? What morning happens? breath. Morning breath. What is morning breath exactly? Got some plaque. <laughs> That's correct. Morning breath is the smell that's derived from the overgrowth of the bacteria overnight. Because if you flossed and brushed, you sanitized your mouth. You didn't sterilize it, right? So there's still bacteria there. And if it's exponential, right? If you have one cell, I'll show you this later in the semester, how one cell after about eight hours can become billions, right? And so overnight, your mouth went from being clean and floss to being dirty again, right? The two dirtiest parts of the human body are the mouth and the anus. And they're in the same system, right? They have the same organisms, right? So if you take a swab from your mouth and a swab from an anus, you're gonna find a lot of the same organisms, right? It's amazing to me. So really from a, micro, from a microbiological perspective, your anus and your mouth are just as clean or just as dirty, however you wanna look at it. Isn't that cool? Think about that, Miss Alexi, next time you kiss your favorite person and give them a good smoochie. Are you with me? You're really just sharing a whole bunch of microorganisms. Yeah, yep, Rosa, yeah, for a lot of reasons, right? But yeah, also I'm having kind of a similar issue because I have cedar fever. And so of course I can't breathe through my nose. So most of my breathing, as you can tell, because as I'm talking, I sound very nasally is done through my mouth. So when I go to bed, I have to sleep kind of in a seated position. And even then, 
I'm breathing through my mouth. And so my mouth gets really dry and that's not good for the mouth at all, right? It's, it's, it's an amazing thing that happens, okay? Any questions about what Pasteur did? So here's a lot of foods that are done by fermentation, which are all attributed to uh, Pasteur, right? So pickles and soy sauce and yogurt and kefir and sauerkraut, all these things that we love, right? Uh, but there's a lot of other things that are in products of the metabolic pro processes or pathways of microbes. So antibiotics, right? The first antibiotics were made by microorganisms. Uh, human growth factor and insulin, right? So a long time ago, we used to take insulin from pigs and then we would give that pig insulin to diabetics. Nowadays, we have, we have yeast that have been genetically modified GMO so that they can make insulin for us. Vitamins, diatomaceous earth, uh, uh, drain opener, all kinds of things. I love diatomaceous earth because my wife and I do not like to use chemicals around our house, but what we'll do is we'll go and buy diatomaceous earth. And these are just algae skeletons. And if we have a problem with roaches or fleas or ants, ants is a problem we have, uh, carpenter ants, is we, we will spread the diatomaceous earth all around the house. And when those insects crawl through it, they cut themselves up and they die, right? It's a really great way to, uh, to maintain uh, the amount of insects that are around your house without hurting birds or or lizards or snakes or other things, scorpions. I don't want to hurt scorpions either. Right? So it's, it's an important thing. And you can buy this diatomaceous earth at Home Depot or, or Walmart or Lowe's, right? And so it works really well. Okay. One of my heroes and the guy that to me was really the father of microbiology, although that's argue, you can argue that, is Robert Cook. Robert Cook was a physician. Uh, he was, he and Pasteur developed the germ theory. We'll talk about that later. Um, but he was really big in the causation of infection and disease. He studied anthrax and examined colonies of microorganisms, right? These are some of the things that uh, cooked it, excuse me. So see, these are some of the things that Cook did. Right? He was the first one to use simple staining techniques to visualize microorganisms. He was the first one to photograph bacteria. He was the first one to photograph bacteria and diseased tissue. He was the first one to think about how we could estimate the amount of organisms in a population. And he called it a CFU. A CFU stands for a colony forming unit. Colony forming unit. And one CFU is equal to a cell. Okay. He was the first one. You should know that. We're going to use it all semester. He was the first one to use steam to sterilize media. He was the first one to use petri dishes and media to grow organisms. He didn't develop the petri dish. Dr. Petri did. He was a Oh, Dr. Petri was a botanist and thought they could use these, he thought they could use these dishes, these Petri dishes to grow plants in, but they got too big and they fell over, so it didn't work. And so Dr. Petri said, ah, this is, a, this is a bust. But Robert Cook came along and said, I think I can use that. And so he did. He was the first one to think about using aseptic technique. Aseptic technique, septic uh, means contamination. An A with in front of it means without contamination, right? So these are using techniques to minimize contamination. The nursing program and people who work in healthcare are gonna call it sterile technique, but it's not sterile at all, right? Because it's hard to make a body sterile or a room, a, a room sterile, you can't really do that. 
it's aseptic technique. But you got to use the vernacular that the industry uses, right? So if they call it sterile technique, you should call it sterile technique. He was, he was the person who first thought of bacteria as an individual species, and he he attributed that to their colonial morphology. So if you think about morphology, somebody tell me, remind me what morphology is. What's morphology? What's morphology? Shape. Mm -hmm. Shape and, and colony would be these things that are growing on the plate, right? So you can see that there are 12 little arrows pointing to these different colonies. And if they have a different morphology, if these colonies have a different morphology, Robert Cook said that if they had a different morphology, they must be a different species. And he was correct. So interesting that he could do those kind of things just by observation, right? Because in, the, in those days, he wasn't using the techniques that we use today to identify these organisms, right? But that's not, that is not what uh, Robert Cook is most famous for. Robert Cook is most famous for his work with his postulates, right? So just listen for a minute. I'm going to tell you what his postulates were, and then we'll talk about it. Cook's postulate state, number one, for every single infectious disease, there's a single infectious agent that is responsible for that infectious disease, okay? Number two, from an infected individual, it is possible to isolate and purify the infectious agent from that individual, okay? Number three, if we were to take that infectious agent that was isolated and purified from an infected host, we could put it into a suitable host. And number four, that suitable host would develop the signs and symptoms of the infectious disease, right? Isn't that cool? What did he just basically say by those postulates? What did he say? Is that if we have an infection, no matter what that infection is, there's one thing causing it usually. And if we can figure out what that one thing is, we can intervene and we can treat the patient and maybe cure them, right? So how many people have ever heard of or ordered a CNS? very common in clinical settings, okay? CNS stands for culture. Uh-huh, not stain, but close. Culture and sensitivity. That's correct, Sarah. How did you know that? Oh, okay, okay. That gives you plenty of credence right there. You know stuff, right? Yeah. Culture and sensitivity is culture. Tell me what it is. Sensitivity. Tell me how to kill it, how to treat my patient, right? This is Cook's postulate, right? We don't say, we don't go down to our, our friend and neighborhood microbiologist, me, and say, hey, will you uh, test Cook's postulate on this? We tell them, hey, here's a, here's a specimen. I need a CNS done. I'll take care of you, right? And I'm going to tell you, in, in the clinical world, if you're a microbiologist, you have 18 hours. And you better have an answer in 18 hours. Because if you don't have an answer in 18 hours, you're a failure as a microbiologist. A lot of pressure down there, right? People's lives are at stake. Right? And so we want to be sure that we can do that. So in 18 hours, I should be able to identify the organism and have some idea of how to treat it. Right? Nowadays, you can do it in, in about four hours because we have all these different ways to do it that are uh, kind of automatic and computer generated. So if, as the microbiologist can set it up and then the the machine can work with very small amounts 
of the organism and either through and either through biochemical means or DNA mechanisms, we can figure out what the organism is. But it can be done really quickly. Isn't that cool? Yep. We have a lot of things at our disposal. Now, some don't get me wrong. Sometimes there are just things that are going to baffle us, right? Because you know we don't know we don't know exactly what Mother Nature has planned for us. Mother Nature is creative and she is an assassin. So I'm going to tell you right now that, you know, that, I mean, if you think about COVID-19, thousands of mutations, right? We've only heard about three, but that's because of the, that's a natural process of the virus. They just mutate that many quick, that, that quickly. Bacteria are slower to do that, but still they do mutate. So we have to be ready to do all we can to help our patients. So here's a bunch of individuals who have all added to the discipline of microbiology. You're not going to be responsible for this at all. I just, if you want to look at it, you can. Okay. So I will ask you uh, like some simple questions on exams about things like Carl Linnaeus and Van Leeuwenhoek and Reddy and Pasteur and Cook. But I'll also ask you about Samuel Weiss. He was the first individual to think about hand washing, right? And I changed my mind. I'm not going to ask you about Samuel Weiss because Samuel Weiss, I'm going to give him credit here, but Samuel Weiss gets no credit. Do you know why? Because there was another individual who took his idea and ran with it and implemented it in a hospital. And that particular individual gets all the credit. Does anybody know who that individual is or was? Who is that individual? Are y'all getting tired? Who was the individual who implemented hand washing? This lady right here. That's right. She was a nurse. Nightingale. Nightingale saw how hand washing could be utilized and she implemented it in, in the hospital. She was a nurse and she cut down infections drastically, right? So she gets all the credit, although Samuel Weiss came up with it first, right? That's just the way it is. Lister was an individual who thought about using antiseptics. Now, antiseptics are different. They're chemicals or physical agents. An, an aseptic was Cook, and he was talking about just using techniques to minimize contamination. Lister said, we can use these chemicals or these different types of physical agents, UV, to help to cut down on infectious agents. Right? We pay honor to Lister how? What did we name after Lister? Listerine, that's correct, right? That's good. Dr. Snow was infection control. He was a physician and what he basically was doing was he was studying the transmission of infectious disease in large populations, right? And he specifically looked at cholera and we'll, we'll tell his story later. But what he figured out is if you knew the source of the epidemic, you could intervene and remove that source, and then the infection will go away. And that's what he did. So he's known as a father of epidemiology. And even today, we use his techniques to help to manage outbreaks, right? Now, we're not doing a real good job of COVID, mostly because there's a lot of people who don't believe in science. But, um, but if everybody did what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't have COVID-19 to deal with very much longer. It's going to end up being like influenza. It's going to be in the population forever. And some people will get it and some people will continue to die from it, right? But it's going to be like influenza, right? If you want to get protected, you get an annual COVID vaccine um, or you don't, right? Jenner was the first individual to think about using vaccines. 
what he noticed was that people who were who had uh, cowpox never developed smallpox. And he said, why is that? And so what he did was he took some of the stuff from these uh, people's uh, sores where they had cowpox and he injected individuals with that stuff, uh, exudate, and people became immune to smallpox, right? The word vaccine comes from the Latin vaca, also Spanish, for cow, because these people were associated with the dairy industry, right? And that's where vaccine gets its name, because the cattle, the cows, played a significant role in our first understanding of vaccines are utilized, right? Right. So it's an interesting thing. Has anybody ever heard of a no-sode? Look at all these cool words, Sassad, that you're learning today. Anybody ever heard of a no sewed? Of a no sewed? A no sewed is a exudate or excretement from the human body that has the infectious agent. And some people believe it's it's a big thing in Canada. Some people believe that if you have somebody who has these things, you can take some of that pus or whatever, and you can put it in somebody else's body and they'll develop immunity to that infectious agent. That is true, but you're going to come down with the infection also, right? So they don't, these individuals do not believe in vaccines. Uh, I know that is gross, but they believe in no soaps, right? You can look it up. Okay. Isn't this cool? Look how everything is related, right? We give we give a lot of um, credit to Ehrlich because Ehrlich was the first one to think about using uh, drugs to help to treat people. And so when you and I think of chemotherapy, we think about uh, the chemotherapeutic treatments for cancer, but chemotherapy really is just putting anything into the body that has a pharmacological effect, right? And so any drug you take that has a pharmacological effect really can be attributed to the work that was done by Ehrlich, okay? Any questions? So if we think about microbiology, it's an umbrella science, it's a, a discipline, and they have all these other you have all these other disciplines underneath it, right? So just look at these things. Bacteriology, protozoology, mycology, study of fungi. We're going to do that today in lab. Parasitology, phycology, study of algae. Infection control, epidemiology, industrial microbiology, food and beverage technology, microbial metabolism, genetics, genetic engineering, etiology. Etiology is the study of causation. Cook, right? That's his work. Virology. Environmental microbiology, ecological microbiology, uh, microbial morphology, antiseptic uh, medical techniques, hospital microbiology, serology, immunology, chemotherapy, and pharmaceutical microbiology. And there's some people's names on the other side. If I didn't mention them already, I'm not going to test you over them. Okay? But look at look at the richness of the science of microbiology. It is, it is an important, beautiful thing to think about how this science came to be. So as we, in, as we begin to end today, we are really interested in how genes work, right? And so my goodness, we have made so many strides in understanding how DNA works to, to work on the first ideas that Watson and Crick um, put together, right, for us. We know how DNA replication works, we know the structure of DNA, but now we have so much more knowledge, right? How many people have heard of CRISPR? How many people have heard of CRISPR? Yeah. CRISPR is a gene editing tool. And Jenna, I know, I know Amadera knows this because she took me for 1406 and I talked about it. 
but Jenna, do you know that there are three individuals right now who have or who had sickle cell disease and who were treated with CRISPR <coughs> so that so that researchers and physicians went in and edited their genes in their cells to correct the sickle cell mutation and basically put in the correct mutation. And of these three people in the early clinical trials, two of them have been cured completely from sickle cell disease. And one of them is still undergoing the process, right? But the fact that we use CRISPR, um, what high school did you go to? Oh, okay. Um, I have to talk to you later. There's a, I have a Elijah Robinson in my other class, and he's from Lake Travis. He knows a lot too. Do you know him? Okay. Well, anyway, you Lake Travis people are smart. Okay. So anyway. Um, it, it's this has important implications because now if we can if we can edit a mutation that occurs early in life we can surely edit mutations that occur later in life like cancer in my lifetime i have 20 good years left i think that we're going to be going in to people who have cancer and editing their cancer cells to basically say uh we want you to be normal Right. And so every cell that comes after that would be normal. My initial thought and other people's initial thought is we could edit, we could edit these cancer cells to basically say, die. Right. What's the term for cell, for program cellular death? Who knows what the, what the term is for program cellular death? Miss Amy, you've been quiet for a little while. Apoptosis, a did you go to Lake Travis too? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing thing, right? How this can happen. So recombinant technology, editing technology, gene therapy. A lot of people think that the mRNA vaccine that we have right now from Moderna and Pfizer, BioNTech are really changing your genes. That's not true at all. But what I will tell you is every time you get an infection from a virus, your DNA gets edited. It gets, because these viruses leave little pieces of DNA from them in your particular uh, cells. And we're gonna talk about that and how that works later. Especially we're gonna use cases like chicken pox, shingles and, uh, and herpes. We'll talk about how that works later. It's gonna be fascinating. You guys will love it, okay? So the last thing we're gonna talk about today I think, let me make sure. Yeah, the last thing we're gonna talk about today is how we can use microorganisms to clean up the environment. We call this bioremediation. And I'm gonna use a classic example. The classic example happened in the 1980s where uh, one of the big oil tankers from Exxon uh, ran and hit a sandbar right off the coast of southern Alaska by Valdez. And this particular tanker was known as the Exxon Valdez. Now, for those of you who are Spanish speaking, it's Valdez, but they call it Valdez up there. And so I'm gonna pronounce it like they do so that there's no confusion. There's millions of barrels of oil that were spilled into the sound and it, it destroyed a lot of stuff, right? A lot of animals died, things like that. Now, Exxon did their best. They spent millions of dollars trying to clean this up, and they did a really good job, right? But they couldn't get all the oil up off of the bottom of the ocean nor off of the shore, and so they were really worried. And so they heard about this company out of Austin, Texas, uh, known as the Alpha Group. And the Alpha Group had been doing a lot of research with bioremediation products, organisms, right? And they called them up and they said, can you help us? And the Alpha Group went up to Alaska and they sprayed their microbes all over this contaminated area and in the waterways. And the microbes went to work and they broke down all of the oil, all the hydrocarbons into glycerol and fatty acids, all of which could be used by the environment. And ladies and gentlemen, the area off of the Southern coast 
of Alaska is almost exactly like it was before the oil spill because of the work that the Alpha Group did and the work that the microbes did. Now you can look this up, right? Let me let me make sure that that you have the correct. That you have the correct spelling. You can look this up. It might be an S at the end, but um, but look it up and check it out, right? But it didn't make any difference, Amy. I was grumpy because you know I grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, and any time there was, because you know, there's so much oil drilling going off off the coast of Texas. You, know, you go to the beaches, there's going to be tar on the beach all the time, and that's just simply spillage coming off of those oil wells out there. And it just makes me mad when I'm walking around the sand and I see this stuff. And sometimes I get it on my feet. I'm like, oh, great. But anyway, but for a long time, I was punishing Exxon because of the problem that they caused in Alaska. Now, Exxon didn't know this, but it made me feel better because every time I needed gas, I would never go to Exxon. Right? I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to give them any business. Right. I forgave them eventually because I have a new enemy. My new enemy is British Petroleum, right? Does anybody know what British Petroleum did that pissed me off? What did British Petroleum do? BP, that's correct. Oil spill where? In the Gulf, event horizon, right? Yeah. So uh, millions, these guys didn't know what the hell they're doing. Millions of gallons throughout the entire coast of the eastern part of Texas, all of Louisiana, all of Mississippi, all of Alabama, most of Georgia, and some of Florida, right? And the Alpha Group uh, by then, right, had become bio, um, Microback International. Microback International is located in Round Rock, right across from Ikea, right? So if you're at Ikea and you look across the highway, you can see them back there, right? Microback International basically told them, we can help you clean this up. But get this, BP, a multi-billion dollar company, an annual company of multi-billion dollars, thought that they were too expensive. So they con they contacted another um, company, I'm not going to mention their name, Dow, um, and they bought surfactants from them. The surfactants they sprayed on the surface of the oil spill. It made the oil heavier, and the oil fell to the bottom of the ocean. Problem solved, right? Except my brother lives in Louisiana. He lives in New Orleans and Morgan City. And he'll tell you that the bayous are still contaminated. But what what BP did um, was they did have a fund where if you were if your if if your income was affected by the oil spill, they would pay your income on a monthly basis for so many months. I don't know. And so tourism and of course uh, fishermen and people like that all got money from BP. And so they were happy. So BP played on that by going over and asking these people if they'd help them, if they'd help them make a commercial. And you might have seen those commercials, right? Prior to the pandemic, they were happy people saying, come on down to Mississippi, everything is fine, right? They did a real good job with public relations, right? With marketing. But really, they were hiding the truth that the waters are still polluted. And so even after that, um, because they still didn't do anything, the U.S. levied this really huge fine on them, and they had the audacity to basically say, that's too much. We want to go to court to try to, to, try to negotiate. Right? If I was a judge in that courtroom, I would have basically said, mm, I'm going to double that price because you are just didn't learn your lesson. Okay? So you can look up the history of those particular oil spills if you want. Um, but you can see that the one that used microbes to clean it up, bioremediation, uh, was successful. And the one that didn't is was not successful. Okay. 
ladies and gentlemen, we're going to stop there for today um, because we still have 